Well, hello, this is Peter Combs from Bitamount.com and P.O. Combs Asian Art in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And today is April 10th, 2020, and this is our weekly video. But before we get started on this week's video, something happened in the last, it's been happening for the last week and a half, and I wanted to bring it up to everybody. Uh, uh, it has to do with uh, the inquiry programs that we run on the website. Uh, down here, if you, if you have an object that you're thinking of buying at an auction, uh, you can click this little button here. It's called the Preview assistant preview meaning uh, you know to look at an item before you buy it not after and uh, you can submit to us up to three links from uh, any auction in the world we'll go take a look at it for you and tell you what we think of it whether or not you should buy it it's similar to the idea identification assistant service we have where you can uh, submit images to us of objects you own or objects that you're thinking of buying and we'll tell you you know what our thoughts are on it and give you our opinion and so forth and this week we got a bunch of inquiries and last week we got a number of inquiries from an, uh, regarding an auction in Roswell, Georgia. And uh, some of you uh, may have seen this. Here it is, Roswell Auctions, uh, located at 1050 Northfield Court, Roswell, Georgia. And uh, I remember looking at this and thinking, you know, I remember Roswell rang a bell. And when I saw this Northfield Court address, it really rung a bell. And I said, where have I seen that before? And um, I did a little bit of uh, looking, and quickly I came up with this. Lauren Auctions is at 1050 Northfield Court, Suite 125, Roswell, Georgia. And I thought for a minute, well, maybe a, another auction house sprouted up next door, and uh, it's a different name. And so we did a little more digging, and uh, this will help refresh your memory. This is uh, the Lauren Auction Gallery, and this is their uh, a prestigious auction house founded by industry's most esteemed experts. Uh, I guess they don't have a uh, proofreader for whoever's writing their website. The 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 uh, that's rather funny. I did I did I remember looking into this site early on, trying to find who their experts are, and they don't even list the names of one person that works there on the site. They don't even have their auction license number posted on the site, which they're supposed to do under the law, but. Uh, for some reason, they didn't. So, at any rate, this this will remind you more about our, our our interactions with Lauren Gallery. We did a series of videos and a couple of blogs on the copies they were selling. We had people emailing us pictures saying, "What is the story with these guys?" And we did a couple of opinion pieces and said that the stuff all looked like fakes and copies to us. And uh, uh, Google uh, treats our website uh, very very well. So what happened was it ended up promoting these posts uh, right up the uh, ladder, so to speak. And um, it, what you get now is if you Google in Lauren auction galleries, Lauren comes up here, and then down here come the videos we did on them selling fakes. And then below it, um, there's a, a series of articles where they have our, our blogs listed about uh, the law, uh, threatening of a lawsuit and so forth. We did post the lawsuit right onto the site, and you can go look at it. Here it is, and you can read through it. It's pretty hilarious. They go through and cite the individual uh, videos that we did and why we should just take them down or, or be sued because we've done something that was actionable. It wasn't actionable opinion pieces. They can't really do anything about it. And um, I even offered uh, if they can come up with one misstatement we made and, and demonstrate it to me, I'll be happy to apologize. And I never heard from the lawyers again from there. And that was about a year and a half ago. All right. So there it is. But one of the things that struck me funny was that I went to Google Earth just to see, to make double sure they were in the same place. And here's 1050 Northfield Court unit number 125. And here is 1050 Northfield Court, Unit 240. They're in exactly the same place. And here's a picture of the, the little strip mall that they operate out of. It's a, sort of a pretty scene out in the middle of the country somewhere. I don't know where it is, but that's where they're located. And the other thing that caught my eye was that when I began to look at the objects, I saw the name Arlen Holmes repeatedly um, um, uh, as provenance for the Roswell auction. And I Googled him, and it turns out that a year ago they were handling Mr. Holmes's estate, apparently, um, at Lauren Gallery. So, so uh, it's fairly safe to assume that there's a connection between Lauren Galleries and Roswell Galleries. And uh, why they came up with a new name, I don't know. They don't have a website for it yet, and so on. But onto the objects, we're going to take a look. This is the uh, Roswell Auction Gallery's uh, listings on live auctioneers, and they all bear a stunning resemblance in the type of material and uh, the claims being made to the ones the way that Lauren Gallery did it. And uh, here's another day of their sale. It's a two-day event. It's a two-day auction. And not everything here is attributed to belonging to Arlen Holmes. So I want to make you understand that. But in my opinion, everything I've seen on here is a copy. All right, everything. All right, and that's just 
how I'm looking at it, all right? And they have things like this. And you always have to ask yourself, when you find a, a, a something that would be, if authentic, a great rarity, how on earth could it possibly turn up from a guy that built a major collection? If this stuff was all authentic, it would be one of the most important Chinese porcelain collections in private hands in the world, in the world bar none. Just, just unbelievable. And how it ended up in Roswell, Georgia, with six to $900 estimates on things like this. It's a chin lung peach jar. They didn't even identify it properly. They called it a pomegranate reward vase. These are very famous form. These, those are peaches, not pomegranates. And they're all tied to the Chin Lung Emperor, his 60th birthday. There's a whole there's a whole story about it, about peaches and birthdays and whatnot. But it, we won't, I'm not going to get into it. But there it is, with a six to nine hundred dollar estimate. When this jar of authentic would be worth in in into the millions, okay. And uh, here you have another piece that's supposed to. I think this was another piece. Yeah, supposed to have belonged to uh, Arlen Holmes. I'm not saying it didn't belong to him. He may have bought them, but it, it, it's a it's a reproduction Guangxu vase uh, uh, with a, again a, another six to nine hundred dollar estimate. It seems to be their favorite estimate, and. Um, if authentic, this is a uh, you know fifteen to twenty five thousand dollar pot, and then you then they had some really big major fakes like this, the Yan Dynasty uh, Guan Jar. Uh, everybody knows about these. Everybody has seen the real ones. They're in the Top Capi Museum. They're in the Palace Museum. They're in all major museums today. Uh, virtually nearly all of them. A few are in private hands, but they didn't make that many, and they're extremely rare. They've been extremely rare for centuries. And uh, this one allegedly belonged to Mr. Arlen Holmes. And it is a brand new piece. This this piece is well brand new, meaning it was made you know in the last 30 or so years. I can't you can't say whether it was made in 18, 1980 or 2018. There's no way of telling, but it's 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 clearly not an old piece. And it has a six to nine hundred dollar estimate instead of a one to two million dollar estimate. And then getting on to examples like this. This this actually made me laugh. I don't know if this belonged to him. No, it, this was not one of Mr. Holmes's, but it was titled as a Qing Dynasty um, uh, Scrifato Ground Turquoise Blue Gray's Candle. It's not a candle holder. This 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 particular form comes from this. The, uh, these were made during the Qin Lung period for the Qin Lung Emperor on order, and he typically gave them to visiting Buddhist um, uh, uh, monks and important religious figures as, as, a, as a sign of uh, devotion to the faith. Uh, Qin Lung was very religious, and uh, these are pretty rare. I know a bit about them because we owned this one and sold it a number of years ago, and I, as I recall, it went for about $65,000. It was over 10 years ago. And uh, here's a pair of them done in this crazy color with a rain mark. These were ne the originals were never marked. So I don't know why they put the mark on there. And they were never, ever made in this color during the uh, Chin Lung period, even though they claim it's from that period. That color didn't exist, as far as I know, in the Chin Lung period, with a six to $900 estimate for the pair. And then on to this, the Jundi uh, 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 plate with the, with the, uh, the, the pomegranates. And the, this has pomegranates and so forth in it. And, um, and peaches. No, those are peaches. Those are not pomegranates. Sometimes they are pomegranates. This one is just peaches with, 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 with flowers going around the outer edge. Um, there's a detail of it with all the phony heaping and piling effect. Uh, six to $900 estimate, again, on a plate that would otherwise, if authentic, would be worth you know, high six, seven figures. Ditto for this, the yellow plate, another copy uh, that apparently belonged to Mr. Holmes. And uh, this is the granddaddy of all the fakes, is this, obviously, is this massive, very famous type of Yan Dynasty porcelain, uh, unbelievably rare. And the idea that somebody could build up a collection like we've just seen that's filled several auctions for these two auction houses, however they're structured, uh, and the guy just bought them around the countryside and was selling them, you should just tell anybody, no. If this came onto the market, it would only be handled either by a major uh, 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 gallery, uh, you know, Eskenazi, Chait, uh, that sort of thing, or one of the major auction houses, Bonhams, Christie's, Sotheby's, uh, maybe Tajan in Paris, uh, uh, Guardian in China, something like that. It sure wouldn't be going through an auction house with one auction or two auctions under its belt. And then onto this, a Guangxu tea dust glaze uh, vase. They call it a reward vase. I have no idea why. Um, these were not reward vases, but it's, it's an interesting name to throw on it. Um, it is just all wrong. The color is wrong. The mark is wrong. The glaze is wrong. All this other stuff. But 
if authentic, these are worth uh, Guangzhou examples like this are worth anywhere from twelve to eighteen thousand dollars in today's market. And then this, the Chin Lung Pierce Celadon, and it's pretty. These are beautifully made pieces. I'm not saying they're unattractive. I'm just saying they're not authentic. Um, and if, if you want to buy it and you want to own a, a great copy, these are good copies, but they're not real. They're not authentic. And uh, this one, uh, this belonged to no, this one did not belong to Ireland. This belonged to somebody else apparently, or they're not saying it belonged to Ireland. I don't know. But you want to be very careful. Um, and uh, we will uh, get some of these images and post them on a blog and tie them to this video and put them up um, on the blog post in the next uh, in the next few days if we get a minute to do it. All righty. So Roswell Auction Galleries appears to be tied to Lauren Auction Galleries. And uh, Arlen Holmes, whoever he was, um, seems to have bought an awful lot of fakes. And um, it's uh, unfortunate. And uh, if you buy them, you're going to re probably regret it a great deal unless you buy them assuming um, that you know that they're, they're copies. And, and you're, you can live with that, which is okay. If you can live with it, it's fine. I'm, you know, that's, that's fine. Because most of us aren't in a position to shell out millions for porcelains. All right. So now we're going to get on to the regular weekly video. I hope you found this useful. Okay. And here we are with the regular weekly video. And I don't want anybody to think I'm, I'm, I'm picking on this one particular auction house, by the way. I'm not. There are dozens of auction houses across the country that are selling copies and all kinds of things. And if you belong to the uh, global member pages, you can access the report card there. And on it are listed about 275, 300 auction houses at this point. Some of them are great, and we rank them A, B, C, D, and F. And uh, the two auction houses I just mentioned are both Fs and avoid always. But there are some that are very good. And uh, as you know, if you're using the global pages, uh, if you're a subscriber, uh, we've been featuring them, and there's some great things on there. All righty. And uh, one of the things I wanted to mention this week was we updated the pages twice on Sat. We did it on Saturday. We did it on Wednesday. And we're going to have to do it again because a bunch of auctions closed uh, yesterday. And uh, we're going to get into them. But one of the things I wanted to share was that there's some very nice things right now on Invaluable and on Live Auctioneers on the global pages that we've filtered out. As you can see, there's a lot of good Japanese stuff. If you're a Japanese buyer um, and you subscribe, go over and take a look. There's some good things on there, some great Netskis, Inros, and so forth. And uh, if you uh, check out the pages uh, uh, on Invaluable, you're going to find uh, – uh, no, this is the Live Auctioneers page. Invaluable is coming up next. There are some great uh, Ming pieces. There's some really nice export wares on there. There's some uh, uh, very, very nice uh, Wan Li plates. And then you have things like this. You have th This is uh, up as this very nice uh, match safe. And um, – it closes in seven days. It's Meiji period, mixed metal, relief worked, lots of gilding on it, some silver patinated brass, or bronze rather, excuse me. And this is uh, the Ross Auction House is having that sale. And then this. This didn't sell again. This, this is a very, very nice Chinese Amari vase. It has gone through um, uh, live auctioneers and invaluable, I think, two or three times at this point. They have a crazy estimate on it, and they're not able to sell it. And uh, I really like this. I think it's a good thing, but I think it's probably worth you know eight to twelve thousand dollars, not thirty to fifty thousand. It evidently has a massive reserve on it. Uh, this is Hess Fine Auctions in Florida, and I suspect they uh, they seem like pretty nice people. I think they're probably sick of this consignment by now, um, and would you know if you like this jar, you might want to call and make an offer for it because I suspect they might be willing to sell it at this point. It's a good example, and it's quite big. Uh, 23 inches tall without the lid. So this was a beast because uh, it would be 26 or 7 inches with a cover. Uh, so you might, you, if, you, if you're a collector and, you've, and, you, and you're interested in, in that kind of thing, you might contact Hess Auctions in Florida and see if they could negotiate a direct sale. A lot of auction houses do that. People don't realize that. If you see something pass at an auction, a little heads up here, if you're watching an auction and something you notice passes, uh, you can contact the auction house afterwards and see if they want to do a private sale of it. They often do. Some of the best pieces I ever bought, I got from auction houses on negotiated sales after the auction, and I bought them for half the low estimate in, in, in many cases or less. So you, you want to check it out uh, because often the lawyers have to get the estate settled. They can't wait for another auction, and they take the money. So just a, just a little tip there, okay? And this is something that just went up. This is a really, this is, this is on the, uh, I think on the uh, Invaluable page, is this really beautiful uh, uh, Famille Rose uh, uh, planter. It dates to the early 19th century, but just fantastically well painted. 
the shading of the uh, Famille Rose enamels on this are really, really nice. Uh, always look at the shading, see how well it's done. And the shading on this and the way the, the peacock is done is just absolutely beautiful. It's a really lovely example. It's got a $2,250 to $3,000 X estimate, which is not unreasonable. Uh, that is, I think, well worth it. It's a beautiful piece. And uh, see how that does. It sells in a, in, a, in a couple of weeks. And they also have this came up. And the reason I put this in there, it's a regular, it's an export terrain and under trade. But what struck me about it was the condition of the enamels. The enamels on this and the gilding are just in remarkable condition. It doesn't look like it's been messed with or, or, or cleaned up in any way, but just a really, really good example of a 1770s, 1780s export piece. It has a 2100 to 2800 euro estimate, which seems pretty reasonable uh, because of the condition. The condition is so critical on these. And they also have this. This is a big Wandley charger. This thing is 48 centimeters in diameter, so it's roughly 20 inches across. It looks to be in very nice condition, and uh, it has a metal mount system on the back. You can see here and here is for hanging. Uh, and it has a $2,250 to $3,000 estimate. Is it worth it? In that size, I'd say, yeah, it's probably worth it because it's unusually big. Most Wanli dishes, as you know, are you know 8 to 12 inches, somewhere in there. Um, once they go over that 12-inch mark, they get expensive. Um, but that this one is, is, is quite nice. And also they have this, this very nice Kangxi Femi Ver uh, export market wine cooler. This is a good one and very nice colors, uh, beautifully, beautifully shaped. The potting on this looked quite good. They love the way the foot flare goes under, it flares out. And then you have the, the peacocks fleeing away from the flower and the, these yellow, nicely done, translucent yellow mass candles on the ends and a $2,750 estimate. And then this, this is a beast. This is a big Jijing or one Li period uh, uh, charger. Beautifully done, very nice big example. But gutsy drawing, very powerful drawing on it. The estimate on this is a little bit stiff, 4,500 euros, but we'll see how it does. It's very nice. And it is also big, 42 centimeters. So it's about eight, 17 inches across. All righty. And uh, on to this, this very nice Yongchen period uh, uh, teapot and stand, has its original stand. Most of the time, these teapots that turn up on the market, the, the stand is long gone or, you know, has, you know, it's been divided up in a family and, you know, one relative got the, the under tray and one relative got the teapot. All right, here they are together, a complete set, $750 to $1,000, not bad. Similar one sold on eBay last week just for the teapot. I think it went for, we're going to look at it, but I think it went for sixteen or $1,800. And the other thing that we added onto the under the, uh, uh, the the member pages was this stuff. This is an auction over in the UK that's selling these things. These are not Chinese. These are Persian, but it, they were really beautiful examples showing the influence of Chinese porcelain and Chinese art that went to the Middle East in trade. Um, that started during the Yuan Dynasty and continued into the Ming and, 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 and the Qing, where there was a great in, uh, amount of a large number of collectors of Chinese porcelain in the Middle East and in India too. Some of the, some of the one of the biggest collections of Yuan porcelain is in India, not in China. But this is um, a beautiful example and uh, a nice 18th century pot. And they have several others, which I thought would be fun for people to look at, even if they're not interested in buying them necessarily. But the uh, Chinese influence on Persian pottery um, and Middle Eastern pottery is just so obvious here. Uh, the bottle, face and, bottle vase and so forth. And they also have, uh, uh, Chiswick's has this. They have a collection of beadry ware, which is from India. <clears throat> but the shapes are unmistakably Chinese. This who form uh, vase. Uh, done like a big wine jar, beautifully done, but made in bidar. And bidri ware is this, is is a very uh, a dark metal that they 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 cooked up, and then they would inlay it with silver. And they most famously made hookah bases, a lot of hookah bases out of bidri ware, but they made other objects as well. And there's a number of them in this sale. So if you're on um, Invaluable this weekend on the global member pages, go down and check them out. They're really interesting, and it shows the interaction and influence again with other countries outside of China for trade goods. And, and they adopted shapes, they adopted, as we saw with the Persian pieces, um, the, the coloring, the decoration. And of course, the Persian pieces are not porcelain. They didn't make porcelain. Those are all pottery with uh, sort of quartz glazes over them, but very interesting. 
All righty. Now, let's take a look over and see what went on over on, on Katawiki last week. First thing was this, this really nice iron tetsube. This was a beautiful tetsube. Um, and then it's inlaid with silver and gold. It's a, 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 you know, probably a late Edo or early Meiji period example. I don't remember how they dated They dated it as Taisho period. I think it's a little older than that. But <clears throat> it went for $713. And I think that was a very reasonable price. That was a stellar example. Really, really attractive. Um, here's a picture of some of the metalwork. The silver work on this was spectacularly beautiful. As you can see, it's tarnished. And it sort of blends in with the iron metal with the iron in the pot, okay? And uh, they would clean, I would clean that gently with just a silver foam just to get the silver to come up a little bit. Gold doesn't tarnish, so it's not a problem. But at any rate, it went for $713, which I think was very reasonable. And then this, this beautiful inlaid um, cloisonne Japanese black polished vase. This was a lovely vase. This was a really, really, really pretty vase. It was about a foot tall, and uh, here's the back of it beautifully polished, uh, great colors, nicely formed, and it looked to be in immaculate condition. But the detail of their, their cloisonne work uh, was, was the best in the world when they did these, just absolutely the best. Fine wire or no wire inlay, um, uh, uh, enameling. You know, uh, the, the, Chinese, China, the Japanese examples were particularly notable for their ability to shade colors. And if you look at these, you'll see just beautiful shading in the leaves based on how the light was perceived to be hitting them by the artist. Nice thing. And it went for $845, which, again, I think was a very reasonable price. That was a fine example, really fine. And then over here to this. I had an inquiry about this. Somebody sent me a note, wanted to know what I thought of it, and I liked it a lot. I thought this was a nice garniture set, uh, uh, Japanese bronze, but beautifully done and complete. And these were pretty big. As I recall, these were like, you know, 15 inches tall. But excellent relief work in, in sort of typical of the Meiji period and, and, the, and, and even into the early 20th century. But uh, the set went for $1,702, which was over what I, I I think I estimated. Or maybe I was in that range, but pretty close. Um, but a really lovely, lovely set of uh, metalwork. Beautiful. And then on to this was this. I just like this. These are fairly common. The Meiji period uh, uh, lotus form plates. And then they put dragons and phoenixes and flowers and all of the lappets around the outside. But just a very attractive form. Instantly recognizable as Japanese, but, but very fine quality. And it went for $263. And it was a foot wide. This wasn't a little dish. It was a nice size piece. And I think that was a, just a really great buy if you're a Japanese buyer. Uh, uh, I've noticed lately more and more people are asking about Japanese things, which is which is good to see, because there's some great opportunities for collectors out there right now. Because there's a lot of good Japanese material on the market, and the prices are not particularly crazy. And you know, with the virus thing going on, I know not everybody's in a position to, to, to continue buying, maybe like they were, because the, the paychecks have slowed down a little. But if you are in a position to buy, um, uh, get out there and start looking on the web, because um, prices are a bit softer just in the last week because so many people are at home. They've got their minds on other things. Um, eBay traffic is way down. I've noticed uh, the number of listings of good things from good sellers in Europe and here is, is, is down a bit, um, probably down 30, 40 percent from what I can see. But uh, it'll come back as soon as the, the lockdown is over. But uh, it's an opportunity for people if you're, if you're interested in these things, okay? And then mosey on over to here. This was a nice pair of Femi June, soft, light Femi June uh, with Femi Ver enamel vases. These are good size. They're about 13 inches tall, beautifully painted, beautifully done, clearly 19th century, but elegant. And uh, they did pretty well. They brought $3,058. And it's interesting because there was another good-looking pair of 19th century vases last week that also brought about $3,000. And I thought that was a sort of a strong price. And I think this was sort of a strong price. But it may indicate what people are more interested in these days, too. And then on over to here, if we get it to there, it is, is that Famille Rose Yongshan teapot. I, meant, I had mentioned earlier that we, we were looking at the one that was over on Invaluable. Uh, it was a pot very similar to this with its original undertray. Here is one without it. Okay. Now, it, has, it does have the lotus uh, stems underneath. And you'd have to examine them pretty carefully. Uh, the underside of it here to check it really carefully for damage because these stems were extremely prone to chipping and damage um, from from the pot being used. But it's a nice old one, and it ended up selling for nineteen hundred and eight dollars just for the teapot. 
All right, so you have one over on Invaluable that's got a, about a thousand dollar estimate, thousand euro estimate, with the undertray, which makes it interesting. And here's another Famille Rose, uh, probably Young Chen or early Chin Lung rooster teapot. This is a nice one. I like the big dome top on it. It's nicely potted, and uh, it ended up selling for five hundred and eleven dollars. And then on to this was one of the Catagons. Uh, this form we've talked about many times in videos. They come in all kinds of shapes and colors. This one is under glazed blue, obviously. And uh, it brought what they typically bring. It was right in the center, right, right on the money, $626. We've said many times that these pieces typically sell in the five to $750 range, uh, depending on the quality and so forth. This was a nice one. It did have a series of uh, Kangxi marks on the bottom. It is not a Kangxi pot. It's clearly later, but it did have Kangxi marks. All right, and some collectors just like having marks, so that's a good thing. And then on to this was this uh, very nice 18th century terrine, uh, no under tray, with uh, armorial crests on it and boar's head handles. And uh, this did uh, pretty well. It brought $375, but the enamels were a little bit worn. And uh, had it been absolutely, absolutely perfect, it probably would have brought double that. All right, but you can see this wear to the enamels or along the edge and so forth. And because terrines were used, they people ate out of these all the time. It was a, it was a, it was a common d dinner table uh, item. And then on to this, we talked about this last week. I just mentioned it because I thought it was very nice that you could get four cups and four saucers, have an instant little set of a well-known sort of stock pattern that was used uh, heavily in, in, the, in the 18th century, around 1780 to 1800. It was a very common pattern, and uh, it did pretty well. It brought $580 for the four, all right? But, it, but you, eight pieces of porcelain, it seems reasonable. And then on to this was the uh, finally closed was uh, Tony's uh, wonderful Chinese export tray. And in the end, I think somebody got a great buy. This was a good thing to own. This will be nice. If I owned it, I'd put it right on a wall in my dining room. I think it's really, really attractive. Very interesting. And uh, lots of patterning going on and butterflies and insects. Lots happening on this thing. And uh, look at this, $455. I hope one of you got it because this was nice. This was a nice, genuine export thing from the first half of the 19th century. And then over here to this, let's get it to load. There we go, the Nonia Straits uh, 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 Phoenix dishes. Nice looking pair, marked bottoms, uh, good good enamels and so forth. Uh, I like the fact that the, the flower on the right is a little bit pinker than the one on the left, but they're two different types of flowers too. But uh, I like the way they did that. So they're not identical, they're not a mirror pair, they're a complementary pair. And uh, they look very nice. And they brought $461, which I, th I think was a, f a perfectly good price for these pieces, given what Neonia Straits pieces have been selling for lately. We've seen some of them, you know, they, bring, they can bring five or $10,000. All right, and then on to this was this Batavia Ware uh, pot. This was a good little one, nice one. Um, um, uh, good brown glaze on it, nice Famille Rose enamels, 18th century. There it is. It's got a few bites around the edges, as you can see, but a genuine thing. And it went for $315, which isn't bad at all. That was from a seller over in the Netherlands. Um, but good looking, good looking. If you like Batavia Ware, there are people that just collect Batavia Ware, which is interesting. And then onto this, the Kangxi plate. This was not a huge plate. It looked big in the picture, but it's actually about nine inches in diameter, but very robustly painted. And uh, this one sold for $286 in good condition. And then over here to this was this book. I have this book. I bought it when it was new in 1989. <laughs> I'm dating myself. Anyway, this is from the, the David Foundation, which is now part of the British Museum. And Percival David, as you know, or, ma or many of you know anyway, he was one of the great, great, great collectors of the 20th century. And he owned the famous pair of Yuan, the da they're known as the David vases, the big Yuan dynasty vases that are dated and have all that information on them and they have every decorative motif known and are probably, you know, if they were to be sold, would be certainly in the top two or three most valuable pieces of sets of, you know, Chinese porcelain existent. Uh, I forget, there's a long story how he got them. But at any rate, um, the seller, Profuni, who we've handled, uh, had on here many times, sells good things. He sold off some of his books. And this was a nice one. The Imperial Taste is a good book. It's a wonderful read. The David Foundation books should be read, um, not just look at the pictures. They're not terribly long, but boy, do they pack information into these old books. And that was a good set. All right, that's some of Profuni's listings here. And then this. 
the uh, Kesey panel with the riders in battle and this fantastic outer border of all the different creatures going around the outside. It's easy not to notice them because the central scene is so active. But the outer border of this, I thought, was as interesting or more interesting than the central scene. You've got elephants and Kieran and mythical beasts and all kinds of stuff going on. I love that. And uh, it's all framed and ready to hang. And it went for $363. Not bad. If you remember last week, we saw it, we had a, a sort of a similar Kesey panel that went for about double that. All right. And this, this one was equally as good. Equally as good. And I think 363 was reasonable. And then the porcelain opium tray. I just like this. I, I like a, a sort of oddball accoutrements, as a lot of you know. And this one I liked a great deal. Um, I, li I like the enameling. I like the scenes. I like the shape of it. This is an opium tray. And as I mentioned last week, most opium trays are done in metal. Pewter, we had seen that pewter one go through here last week that went for over $500. Uh, and no doubt went to an opium uh, accoutrement collector. And this was a nice one too. And it went fairly reasonably, $431 for a nice tray. That was pretty good. That was a good buy. And then on to a few things that are coming up that we've had on here. One is this, this nice uh, uh, late Jai Jing or early Wan Lee period in that era uh, charger. This is a big one, though. This is not a small one. It is over on Katawiki. It'll be on the, uh, on the newsletter page this week. And uh, they call it Swato. I didn't see the back of it. It could be from Swato with that pattern. Yeah, it is Swato. Yeah, late Ming. Um, it is 38 centimeters, though, in diameter. It's a good big one. The bids are only up to 200. It's got a seven to $900 estimate. Seven to $900 for this is pretty reasonable. And then also this one, another big Swato charger is up. And what's nice about this one is that the central enamels are not all worn off on it. Uh, a lot of these uh, Swato uh, pieces with these green and iron red enamels, they were used so much that the central scenes often became obscured just by wear. All right, and not the case there. And then on to this, the big dragon panel. This is a beautiful piece of silk. The colors, the fine quality, uh, 19th century, maybe first half of the 19th century, but beautifully done, just beautifully, beautifully done. And if you, they, fortunately, the seller here did some nice shots of it from different angles and up close. And if you come over to look at this, really look at the details here, this thing is beautifully sewn. And the, and the scale work of the, of the gilt, the gilt uh, threads on the dragon. This is like fish scales, just all, all detailed in beautifully. And this lovely crashing wave bottom here um, with the, the two dragons uh, uh, standing and so forth. Uh, if, you, if, you're into, if you're into Chinese silks, uh, if, you, if you're looking for something to buy while you're stuck at home, boy, this is a nice thing to buy. It's up to $3,050, and I think it's got some room to go yet because it is the quality is so pretty the condition is so good and it, always look at the artwork i always say that just look at the artwork is the work good this has beautiful work on it and it's it's a sort of a standout all right and then over here to this is this really nice um uh, wan li falcon dish molded uh beautifully done here's a picture of the back pretty typical back for one of these but i like the falcon the falcon is sort of an unusual motif and I like the fact that they shaped the bowl like a lotus, like lotus petals. They molded it all the way around. It's a beautiful thing. It's only up to $69. It closes Sunday. If you're a Wan Lee crack porcelain buyer or a late Ming buyer, <clears throat> check this out. You might get a good deal on it. You might be able to buy it for under two or 300 bucks. And then lastly is this, is the Chinese silver with enamel bowl that we talked about. I, Cause these are, these are really rare. Um, and I had said that they, they did teapots in them. Uh, the, the Crosby Forbes collection had some of them in it. He was the silver maven for the Peabody Essex Museum and their curator of China trade. Uh, I knew him pretty well. He was a wonderful guy, uh, uh, wonderful man. And um, this was a, a, a very nice piece of Chinese silver with enamel. And it's getting up there now. It's got, it closes Sunday. It's up to $720. And I, I, I think it's, it's got a bit of room left. It's, uh, Old Masters is selling this um, over in uh, the UK. All righty. And that's about it for the week. We're going to run around and see how much stuff we can find to put on the newsletter page this week. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do. If you like our videos, give us a thumbs up. 
leave a comment. I like reading the comments. I don't always comment because I usually see them on Saturday and Sunday when I'm having my breakfast. And uh, I'm up early. I'm up by 5.30 in the morning typically and or 5 or sometimes earlier. Uh, but I, I like to see, you know, what, what people are interested in seeing, what they're not interested in seeing in the comments and so forth because it guides us heavily on what we do. All right, we do these for everybody to enjoy. So if, if it's something specific you'd like to know more about and it seems like it's going to have general appeal, we'll do it. We'll do it. We have the resources to do a video on almost any topic here that we want. All righty. Have a great weekend. Enjoy it. It's supposed to be sort of nice. Have a good Easter. I have my leg of lamb on order at the Greek meat market, picking it up tomorrow morning. We do a leg every Easter. It's going to be fun. It's a big one. And uh, stuff it with, uh, what are we putting in this? We put garlic in it, uh, chopped rosemary, olive oil, salt, pepper, leave it overnight, take it out early, got to get to room temperature, 450 for the first 15, and then drop it to 350 until it's done. And it's delicious. If you like lamb, that's the way to cook it. That's Julia Child's old recipe. Okay, have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next week, and we are working on another another sort of uh, uh, educational video, and uh, we're just uh, sort of scrambling around trying to get images together. Okay, see you all later. Bye-bye.